Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes a todos los compañeros y compañeras. Good afternoon, everybody. That is with us in this first seminar, Bolivar versus Monroe, which is an effort that we have made this year in the framework of the 200 years of the doc Monroe Doctrine, which is very important for the popular movements in America to discuss this doctrine and also the reaction of peoples and of the free currents. And in this framework, we have some of in this first seminary in within the campaign of Bolivar versus Monroe that we have promoted as a sport from Bolivarianism in this emancipatory current and also the Monroe current. So we have proposed this series of seminaries and in this first opportunity, we want to discuss with all the movements, the element of unity versus this, the integration as a first part of this seminary. We have a very interesting uh, friends that are going to talk about this subject. And the first element is to study the origins of the doctrine of the imperialist project and the Monroe Doctrine, and also to show the uh, project of Bolivarianism as a sovereignty response. Nowadays, those two projects are confronted in our continent. So we want to discuss how those projects are presented in reality and how popular movements react before those projects. So we're going to give the floor to our comrade Laura Capote from Alba Movements. Hi, everybody. How are you? It's a pleasure to me to say hi today. As you know, Carlos already talked about what we're going to do today. And I want to give you, uh, I want to welcome you. And I want to excuse beforehand for some technical issues that may appear, but we are very happy from Alba Movements because we have those three friends that are with us to, to discuss this seminar of Bolivar versus Monroe. We have the friends of the Simon Bolivar Institute, Carlos Ron and Guillermo Barreto, who prepared this first historical intervention related to the origins of the doctrines. What we are talking about is not only, we're not talking about only Bolivar versus Monroe, but also the reaction and the history. And after this intervention, we're going to give the floor uh, to our comrade Leandro Morges, professor from the Buenos Aires University. And we are going to talk about this, all these descriptions. He's going to publish a book about this subject. So we're going to start with the, our friends from the Bolivar, Simon Bolivar Institute. So we're going to share this video. I'm going to share my screen so you can see the video. And then we're going to give the floor to Leandro. What is the, doc what is the Monroe Doctrine? The Monroe Doctrine. In 1983, 2nd, the president of the United States, James, the Monroe, President James Monroe, made 
a gave a speech, speech before the, the United States Congress that became famous as a and then it became foreign famous policy. as a and foreign policy doctrine. He basically, basically says that is Monroe there's a, an opportunity to sign as a principle in which the rights and interests of the United States are implied that affirm the that rights and interests of the United, the United American States continent that because of the independent shouldn't status be considered of the as in the region subject of should not colonialism be considered in the future subject to colonization by so any basically European power. he's saying so he's to the rest of the power countries that there are no opportunity other for powers, new colonies and, saying there isn't any and those territories this that hemisphere achieve independence for there to be any other colonial from power europe cannot with be respect to the countries uh, reconquered again that there can however be no this message behind however this there's a message behind this is not only that there won't it's there won't be a there new intermission by new uh, interference European by a foreign or, or foreign power uh, power but that it also, but also locates the united states with the united states right with the right to of intervene as a, and to become the protector of this a region, protection to those the countries and the countries that are starting Rusia y Austria y donde se acerca Francia también y en donde ven como una amenaza a sus valores monárquicos y cristianos las ideas libertarias que se están generando en América y por lo tanto se ven en la necesidad de aliarse para contrarrestar estas ideas eh, libertarias en este contexto entonces es cuando eh, el primer ministro eh, So in this context is where the British minister uh, Cannon calls the U.S. Ofrece as ambassador and offers to Unidos, donde make ambos se a joint statement between the U.S. and eh, Britain, where both agree that they won't allow interference from this um, sainted alliance of the European Christian powers. Inglaterra los está considerando como un, como un nuevo actor eh, político importante, pero están otros dos personajes, uno muy importante, que es Quincy Adams, que, que viene, viene a ser el secretario de Estado de Monroe, que ve claramente la segunda intención de Inglaterra. Inglaterra tiene un negocio muy importante con América, tiene lazos comerciales muy importantes que quiere mantener y fortalecer, y no le interesa que esos lazos comerciales sean eh, obstaculizados por otras potencias y lo que está buscando es la manera de dejar a Estados Unidos eh, afuera de esto y tener la libertad los ingleses de poderse distribuir el comercio. A esto no cae eh, Adams y le sugiere a Monroe que vaya adelante, que vaya adelante so, con una declaratoria. This idea that was presented to John Quincy Adams Oh, they agreed to make a statement that they won't accept any kind of interference from any other power in the Europe, The declaration the as continent. such, what we know as a doctrine, has three additional topics. Any ten tentative to defend this part of the world is, is going to be considered a danger for the peace and security of the United States. And then he says that the United States won't interfere with the already established European colonies. So when he says that the United States rejects the intention of free set free the colonies of Puerto Rico and Cuba. And he also says about these territories that already have independence, any tentative to control his destiny cannot be seen but as an enemy to the United States. So is a sort of threat that is given because countries such as France uh, were recurring some spaces and have interest in to reconquer some colonies that already lost in the past. So in that point, United States sets with this position or this play of uh, John Quincy Adams, he, it sets a position 
rejecting the possibility of an intrusion, but gives the possibility that they can interfere in other countries. And that's what England didn't want to, that the United States can have control of those former colonies. The, how this was the manipulative media handling of this is interesting because they were able to place this rhetoric around being a protectorate and a protective force uh, in confronting Spain and against Russia. Uh, it was very interesting. They were able to achieve support from the oligarchies the arist aristocracy in the new American republics and to place themselves as an ally that will help protect them against this possible recolonization or reconquest. And this was a uh, difficulty There's for the real independent uh, territories. There's also something curious regarding uh, the, the today's situation is that in the North American continent, we had the presence of Russia, the, the part of the globe known as Alaska was uh, colonized before by Russia and Russia expanded his presence until the Oregon states. And there was even a fort in a, an island close to San Francisco city when Monroe gives this warning, he's addressing it to the Russian that had these uh, aspirations of expanding his territory. So John Quincy Adams, which is, who is the intellectual author of this doctrine when the Tsar Alejandro I declared the prohibition of the boats to be near to their coast. Quincy Adams says to the Russian ambassador, the warning that they would see as an enemy, anyone that sees his territory as an intent of expansion. So this idea of this, the United States that they were the only power possibly in the American continent was already there in that in that this is moment. Also part of a whole ideology of the US founding fathers. To remember that this was a religious group. They were fanatics, fundamentalists, Christians, Puritans, who were the founders of the Republic. They really believe that they have this manifest destiny that they were destined by God to bring liberty to the rest of the peoples. But in their doctrine, this is really implicit, the idea that they're destined by God exceptionally to bring freedom, and the only ones who are able to bring freedom. There's also something really contradictory that they really believe that their ideology needs to be universal, that they are exceptional, but at the same time, they really want to be seen as the ones who will influence everyone else. And we still see that today, that if we listen to the uh, speeches the of US presidents, we'll find this same between line. Monroe's vision and Boliv Bolivar's vision is that the Monroe's project is a continental project under the domination of the United States, while the Bolivar project is a project that emerge from the emancipation, emancipation of the American republics. Bolivar says this part of the world belongs to those who God wants to be and part of it. We have to remember that Bolivar's idea is really based on what San Francisco de Miranda said. He fought in three great revolutions in the American, the French, and the South American revolutions. And he had the great idea of forming one nation that would be around Colombia, from Tierra del Fuego up to Mississippi. And this 
great nation would have its center in Panama. And Miranda, who is the one that developed this first this idea of the great America. The, uh, Miranda's engagement through his entire life is the fight for independence. And Miranda says, I am and I will be I will always be the defender of the rights of our America. And I will defend this cause through all my life. And Miranda had uh, one of the highest range of, uh, in a military speaking. However, there was always a resistance in front of Miranda's leaderships because the Caracas classes felt that Miranda was not was the son of a bakery and so for the high Caracas elites it was uh, seen as a resistance before the Miranda's leadership. So there were two basic fundamental ideas of Bolívar. The first is that independence is not enough. We really needed the unity of all the republics. And the second is that the republic can't be submitted to another power. These are two essential ideas. And this is really within the framework of Bolivarianism as a doctrine. It is firmly opposed to the Monroe Doctrine of the United States in the US as a dominant power on the he continent. He writes a letter to Higgins in 1822 after the, the success in the Carabobo battle. He says, the great day of America hasn't come yet. We have ex pulls a lot of enemies, but we have to have a social pact, which is to form from this world a Republican nation. So Bolivar thought that independence was incomplete if we don't have the independence in the in all the republics. So it's very interesting that there was still within the American oligarchies, they were still thinking of the possibility of becoming allies with Great Britain. And so on this idea of approaching England, is if we put England at the head of this league, we will just be their servants. Because once this agreement with the strongman is, is formed, it creates perpetual obligations for the weak. This is why the unity project in America comes from the Compact of Panama that Bolivar already uh, think about that in the Jamaica letter, the idea of constructing uh, a Congress in which all the nations participants, in which we have a space for dialogue for these new nations and for the rest of the nations in the world. In the this agenda, we can see the characters of this unity. We can talk about one of them, uh, the renovation proposal of Confederation, which is this infrastructure that already Bolivar uh, had a vision inside our Republic, the intention of uh, manifesto uh, publishing and the damage that it caused to the new world, which is a anti-colonialist idea. And also very important to show this uh, emancipatory character of the Congress because there was a decision. We, they wanted to look for a support from Cuba and Puerto Rico and also from the Canary Island and the Philippines. This is to have the balance in the universe. So, Bolivar also proposed signing a treaty between the Confederated States, a confederation that Bolivar proposed that would have be able to 
work against the Monroe Do Doctrine of protecting from Spain. And this was really one of Oliver's uh, main points that he was emphasizing. There they is something talked, between all of the they Confederate also talked states. inside the agenda that we have, to, they had to have a contribution from the different military forces. They thought that they had to have a common military forces to prevent the tentatives of conquering. So if we think about the most recent project uh, with UNASUR, we, they created a defense force in other contexts, of course, but always with the principle of unity for the common defense. And then they also had in the agenda the pressure measures to force Spain to recognize the republics and the relation in the in the borders and how we uh, structure all the uh, territory for this uh, moment of history. And in conclusion, I say the beliefs of the liberator were for all of America. This is why the writer the and the historian was really one from Argentina, Osvaldo Ramos, go to the conclusion that we are a country because we we weren't able to have a nation and but we fail into being Americans. And this is the key of the revolution that we're going to have. Long life to believer. Thank you very much to the comrades from the Simon Bolivar Institute, to the comrade Carlos Ron and Guillermo Barreto that introduced this uh, seminar, Bolivar versus Roma, in the framework of this continental campaign that wants to be an offensive before the 200 years of this oppressive doctrine from the imperialism. Thank you very much. We also want to We want to say hi to different comrades that are in the forum. We have a different represent, representative from different uh, country as Cuba, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Brazil, Panama. So different voices from different organizations that are here with us in this first session. We're going to present now to our second comrade, the comrade Leandro Morgenfel from Argentina, professor from Buenos Aires University, research from the book, Our America 200 in Dispute. Our comrade Leandro is going to talk about the vision of this projects that are confronted and how today those projects are confronted and opposed in our days and how this has an influence in our reality. So we're going to give the floor to the Professor Leandro. He has 20 minutes so he can share with us his visions and his research. So good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you. I'd like to thanks, thanks to Laura and all the people on this continental movement. And after Carlos and Guillermo's presentation, I'm going to follow in the same line. So there's a book that I've been working on for the last few months that's just about to be published. 
So be our America in light of the Monroe Doctrine, and it's being co-edited by several very dear colleagues of mine. It's part of a very interesting catalog of young writers, and I think that many of you probably know many of the writers there. And we were really looking at reintegrating America. And the, so today I'm going to be presenting some of the conclusions of this work that comes from this work, from this book. And it will be available in print if you'd like to have a, find a copy of that, and also in a digital copy. And that will be an open access copy. So on the networks that I'm working, we do have a policy of open access um, through Claxo, so you can download that information if you go to the Claxo webpage. So some of the things I'm going to say today will be expanded on uh, in those resources. So when the book comes out, and that should be around in July. So vecinosenconflicto.com is the website that I run. And you might be interested in following some of my thoughts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and link it to the current debate around this alternative title, which is Bolivar versus Monroe. So I'm part of a working group in Claxo, and there was a panel yesterday, which is happening in Cuba in Thursday, Friday, Saturday, in the Jewish Studies in the United States, and a center in Havana. We're talking about the five, 500th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. And we were talking about this with Sasha Sorrenti, who is the secretary of ALBA. And it was saying within the invitation to this Bolivar, what that Bolivar had said at the Congress, that what's the difference between the two projects, Bolivar's project and Monroe's? So there's an operation on the part of the empire where Bolivar connects with that as an alternative. So on 1832 and December 2nd was where Monroe first proposed this doctrine. And in general, as we saw, you know, with the US was seeing themselves as an extension of European power and trying to stop the recolonization. And it was much more than that as well. And so he's really saying that America needs to be for the Americans. And he was saying that the U.S. needed to put on their own agenda the independence of the American countries. So the doctrine has served over the last 200 years to justify a lot of U.S. intervention in a U.S. in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this idea of America for the Americans is talking about a larger America beyond its borders. So we're not talking about America for all of America, North, South, and Central, but we're really just in that phrase talking about US. And there's been different nuances around it over time. There's, a, you know, more than a dozen different interpretations of what this means. So just the la last week, there was a pre-candidate on the Republican side, Ron DeSantis, who is going to try to uh, challenge Trump in terms of the Republican candidacy. And he talked about the Monroe Doctrine and said, we need to re, we need to update it so that we can uh, be a force against China and a number of other countries. But beyond all of that, which I talk about in my book, there was, you know, basically a continental project from the 19th century up until now of the U.S. to be a continental power. And there have been, of course, geopolitical changes throughout this time. 
and there have been the increase of other polls around the world and the uh, rejection of the some of the free trade agreements in the early 2000s has helped propose different alternatives to this vision. So right now we're really in a crucial period for the destiny or the fate of humanity. There's a lot of changes that are economic, that are social. Our Earth has a huge challenge in terms of accelerating climate change and the effects of the capitalist system. And at the same time, throughout the 20th century, during the Cold War era, there were different challenges to the US. says the ideological idea is an imperial idea of supposedly providing protection and security to the hemisphere. We continue to see them def defend to the end this US approach to security. We can't lose sight that all of this is being reproduced again and again throughout Latin America in an imperialist project. It's an ideological, cyclical ideological project that is continually being a, re being a renewal of the Monroe Doctrine, which is the exceptionalism of the United States including the instruments that are used to impose it. So if we're looking at a more multipolar world and the different conditions beyond the structural differences, we need to find different strategies for a more independent world insertion. So, so we really need to find, just look at the centrality of our region for, in light of the United States. The American, Latin American strategy needs to take into the fact that we are neighbors with the United States. We are a neighbor to the United States. If we think about Mexico, where the US has taken a large part of their territory, we are also the farthest reaches of the US backyard, including the Caribbean. We also have to recognize the huge deposits of natural resources. And so the US with its imperialist appetite is really uh, feeding a, an area of turmoil and chaos and a huge uh, income inequality. And all of this stems from that 200 year uh, formulation of the Monroe Doctrine. There's been over a hundred different US military invasions in the region. We're talking about uh, political assassinations, we're talking about bribing and trying to influence policies around the region. And so, but it really has to do with the strategic location and importance of the region more so than actual strategies. So if we look at the Monroe Doctrine, it seems simple when we first look at it, so that there's no future colonization in the in the hemisphere, there's no more interference from the United from the European powers. But really it's it's the real meaning is much more variable. And so we need to really clarify. And here we're going to look at five myths that I'd like to clarify. So first, the doctrine isn't really from Monroe. It doesn't have any international validity. 
It's just a way of making explicit a particular policy of the United States that took shape in a particular uh, context. And then it became a guideline of US policy toward Latin America and the Caribbean and in their links with uh, powers outside this hemisphere. So in the 21st century, you know, we uh, was looking at the growing power of China and Russia, and that's what we see reflected in the most recent policy of the United States. So despite the fact that they tried to make it pan-American, it ended up just being a solely national policy whose application would not be subordinated to any treaty or agreement with other nations. So of course the US had to hide their real interests uh, toward other countries. Like in 1889, James Blaine as they, and up to today with the Organization of American States, the search of the United States to have this influence really came into confrontation with other countries over the last hundred years. So these words of the Monroe Doctrine, this phrase, causes a certain reaction in people. It continues to harken back to Teddy Roosevelt in 1904. And it really talks about a protective attitude that has its offensive side toward other countries. And of course, you know, as we talk about it, really shouldn't talk about just Monroe. It can, third, it continues to be a valid, uh, a doctrine that is being implemented, even if it uses different words. So it's been changing in terms of the U.S. capacity, the U.S. interests, and it doesn't respond to uh, fixed ideas or norms. Every senator reads this doctrine in their own interests. Talk about this polyform nature of the doctrine. It means that it's this nebulous generalities that can be applied when it's to the advantage of the United States. So in fourth place, Monroe's statement wasn't really interested in the independence of these countries that were just being born. If we think about the Malvinas Islands that had the claims by the English, they show that the US only appeals to this doctrine when it can, is convenient to its interests. In 1833, the State Department really didn't want to apply this doctrine to repel the British as they tried to, as they took over the islands. And then a hundred years later, 150 years later, Ronald Reagan also decided not to apply it in 1982 in the same con uh, context. So it's really a very paternalistic attitude in terms of the manifest destiny where the US has the divine command to expand its borders. So it can just decide bilaterally what happens in its region, in the Western Hemisphere, as its sphere of influence, where it has the right to uh, not be challenged in its exercise of power. As Carlos Pereira says in a key book, if we talk about this, the history of the Monroe Doctrine, this doctrine is really present in two different chapters with the expansion into Mexico And then when it confronts Spain in 1898, uh, fighting for Cuba. 
and in the Caribbean. So it's been 200 years for this Monroe Doctrine. There are structural problems with it that are blocking our development. It is a necessary but insufficient condition for this vision of the one America the Bolivar plan, uh, proposed. And one of the main obstacles over the last 200 years to the needed integration that we have has been this doctrine. You know, the problem is that there are these dominant classes on the national level who are subordinated to these other powerful interests. And they really see themselves as gears that move uh, transnational capital. So history shows us that there have been many processes and moments where we have successfully challenged this subordination that has been tried to impose on the region. So we need to explicitly reject this Monroe Doctrine, which has been sometimes more openly and sometimes more hiddenly applied. And it, the doctrine is not only challenged by the emergence of a more multipolar world that includes China, Russia, India, and other countries, but fundamentally by the resistance of Latin American peoples who have refused to accept this domination. Those who in the 20th century, including the Nicaraguan, Cuban, and Mexican revolutions, we've also had other policies that have challenged U.S. policies in Argentina, Chile, and even resistance against the military dictatorships, as well as the fight to defeat the uh, the different uh, trade treaties. And so we're talking about unionists, we're talking about students, we're talking about environmental activists, human rights organizations, who have really been at the head of these political resistance and the achievements on the social plane. We need to move together among American countries that will allow us to diversify the economic powers if we want to and make sure that there is a true multipolarity or pluripolarity. So it's necessary to reinforce economic development that benefits the people of our region. We need a revolutionary radical program for trans transformation of the whole socioeconomic system. We want to reduce the working uh, week the working day, we need to change the banking system. We need to change the way that land is allocated and owned. And we need to really prioritize the public over the private. We need to have more equal economy. Our America can't be just for North America. It needs to be for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. We are eager to hear from the book publishing and all these initiatives are very important to us so we can deepen in the elements that we have proposed to discuss on the framework of the 200 years of this doctrine. So we have to discuss these elements that Leandro talked about, which are parts of the truth. 
this is not a uh, real doctrines, just some elements that become or became a domination policy in our continent. We want to send our greetings to our comrades that are joined to this first seminary, some comrades from the United States and from Chile, from Ecuador, from Dominican Republic that are joining us in this seminary. We, are, we have also some questions for our comrades, Carlos Ron and Leandro, that have been sent from the YouTube platform. So we're going to read one, a few of them so you can answer. The first question says, it's very common that the two concepts um, are seen as ambiguity, for, but for the Bolivarian project, there are very clear difference between the project of disintegration and the project of unity. What is the difference between the project of disintegration and unity? There, are there any difference? How can we organize the dynamic of regional integration in the last month? We had the Slack summit, the relaunching of UNESUR regarding the confrontation of, this, of those projects. Are we winning or are we having a second attempt of the Lima group in the way, another uh, action from the right wing. What is the role of the Caribbean in the developing of the Monroe Doctrine during the 20th century? And two more questions. The meeting of UNESCO summits in Brazil, how can it help to the American unity and what are the challenges nowadays to progress in the pro Bolivarian process? So those are some of the questions that are sent to us. I don't know if Carlos or, Leand or Professor Leandro can answer. Well, I can have one of, I can answer one of those questions because there are several questions and there are so very important subjects. We're going to talk about, uh, we have, uh, we've seen a very important meeting at an attempt by Lula, the president of Brazil to uh, retake the UNASUR and 11 presidents participated in the case of Peru and other countries, a very important meeting. And Petro, president of Colombia, announced that Colombia uh, is going to join the UNASUR again. And this was a very important institution for the political coordination in the last 15 years, and that had been destroyed because we can remember that six governments from the right went after 2018 when Bolivia um, take the pro temporary presidency and they stopped the actions from the CELAC. So that organization was, also, was, was almost dead. So all this situation is going to be reverted. So I think this is a very important meeting. So we are seeing how in history those wanted to destroy all this uh, or stop all these attempts to make progress of integration. So I want to say something regarding this, that this was very well proposed, the other phase of the Monroe Doctrine, which is part or part of the, this doctrine is not only to avoid yeah that war powers in, in the world confront to the United States the domination of the regions because the interests of the United States depend on the naval force of England that had in that moment 
the power to become a world power in the continent. But the other part of the Monroe Doctrine is to oppose, as they did indeed, to the Bolivarian project. In fact, uh, Bolivar opposed to the United States participation in the Panama Congress because they wanted to stop the support of Puerto Rico to um, be with the Haiti in, the, Haiti in this uh, process. So we have a lot of historical examples because the United States always made this sabotage in any initiatives in the 19th century and other initiatives such as the, the Peron initiative to establish international agreements and try to avoid the Mercosur to uh, incorporate Venezuela and they stop the progress such as uh, the, pr the progress of projects such as the TLAC and the ALBA. So it has to do with the domination in the region. So I think this is a key for the governments and the countries to resist this offense, these imperialist offenses. So I was reading the main uh, newspapers in Argentina and they want to have a strategy to destroy the Lula uh, government because they some of this uh, meeting. Sometimes we don't see this in the press, but the Uruguayan um, president said after a lot of years, he's making this attempt to have a political coordination among governments with different political orientations, such as UNASUR with the CELAC summit in January. And there is a very important imperialist response. And to answer if we are in the worst world or in the best world, I don't think, I, don't, I think we are in a second wave of a progressive uh, administrations with a lot of difficulties because this is a, an energy that it goes around and comes around because we already had the conservative restoration, but we have other processes such as the case of Chile, the Chile case, and maybe in Argentina also. We have we are seeing very complex political progress, but in with Lula, we have an, uh, some uh, historical conditions to have some key uh, projects to reinforce projects as the ALBA. So I think that we have to learn about all these lacks and, and limitations that the former projects had. So we have to have uh, better integration, and I think that our movement is a key has a key role to have progress in concrete projects with popular necessities, projects of infrastructure, economical projects, uh, food security projects, sanitation projects, connectivity projects, defense projects. So. In the first period, I think we fail uh, regarding this, but I think that most of the social movements didn't conceive uh, that as a way to improve the quality of life. But now we need to have a, a more autonomy regarding these projects. Thank you very much, Professor Leandro. So, Carlos, if you want to answer some of the questions. Yes, greetings, comrades. Regarding one of the proposals that they ask us about the role of the Caribbean, we have to recognize that in 
23, when the Monroe doctrines emerged, some of the nations, the Caribbeans, were under the domination of the uh, colonialism, including Cuba and also Puerto Rico. This is why we said that the, some of the key uh, topics is to concrete the end of colonialism in in those two islands. However, I think it's very important for the Caribbean and for the Caribbean identity to understand the fundamental value that the Haitian uh, revolution had in the process of independence in Latin America. Is We are not exaggerating when we say that we wouldn't be an achieving anything if the Haitian process wouldn't wouldn't start all this independent uh, process because it facilitates the several resources such as boats and weapons in a moment in which the troops were destroyed by the and this analysis gives us the project that comes after the slavery abolition. And this is very important because, because this proposes other uh, challenges and tensions. It wasn't an element, uh, a simple element. It was something important for the processes, uh, the upcoming processes. So I think that the Caribbean is a part of these Bolivarian projects confronted to this um, Monroe's project has a key role with the Haitian revolution. In the next seminars, we're going to talk more about this particular subject, but it is important to know that these representatives of the United States that were invited to the Amphitronic Congress had very specific instruction from Henry Clay that was a secretary of state in that moment that to not, to not support the independence so, uh, processes of this island because they didn't want to, they didn't want these colonies to be part of other republics or the process of other republics. And they were afraid that we can, we wouldn't be able to control them. And it was an opportunity to avoid uh, the abolition of slavery because this would have consequences in the region. So I think this is important, but talking about today's world, I think the Caribbean has a very, very important role in our regional construction because in the 20th century, the republics have now and spa a space next month caricom is going to have the uh, 20th anniversary in which we have uh, a group in, a very important group that had a, a, an influence in several organizations and those states are defending their identity and adding up importance to our region. So the Caribbean has an important role in independence because it the, gives the unity to the Caribbean and the CARICOM and the willing to have an independent position even if they have this uh, pressure from the United States and the region that help Venezuela in the OEA but subsequently, we know that with the group of Lime, uh, Lima, sorry, 
we saw strong forces in the continent, in the region, but the Caribbean and CARICOM had resisted to those uh, American pressure. I think this uh, role is very important. Hi, how are you, everybody? So I wanted also to make emphasis in that for Bolivar has always have some uh, limitation to trust in the United States. This idea, the Monroe Doctrine, that was to dominate this part of the world. It's something very interesting. Here's a, John, a quote from John Calvin talking about the U.S. interests. So while Cuba become, is, continues to be a part of Spain, which is a friendly state, so to see what that means in terms of how we will intervene in that place. But I hope that I will never see that if Cuba comes out from under the thumb of Spain, that it won't become under our of our theme and we, of our thumb. And there was a whole plan to invade Cuba and to have Cuba be part of the United States. And there was an internal effort within uh, Bolivar's Colombia to try to stop that process. So really who was stopping Bolivar's orden, uh, orders to support Cuba they invited the U.S. to the Panama Congress when there had been an express order for from Bolivar to not invite the U.S. So they, there had been friendly relationships with the U.S., but there really was a belief that we needed to be strengthened first before we could have a dialogue with the U.S. And without that, it wouldn't have been possible. And that's really what happened. The U.S. moved its pieces on the board, and they managed to co-opt the existing oligarchy in Latin America to really support and benefit these disintegration processes. So, you know, not just the U.S., so that there wouldn't be, pardon me, of the one country that was Bolivar's dreams, but then there was a concession to realpolitik. So, okay, we were not going to be able to be one single nation, but we can be a block, an important block that includes Peru, Rio de Plata, Chile, that it would be a confederation with governments that could be different and diverse, they could have different policies toward the ex, but then there could be um, agreement among the countries to be able to coordinate in confronting powers on the that that were external, and they really needed the unity to counterrest the U.S. project, which is the domination, the hegemony of the U.S. And I don't know if in you and all of your different countries, if you've learned in school, like we do here in Venezuela, but we learn about Pan-Americanism. And we talk about how wonderful unity is. And that was really something that was uh, imparted around the ideal, idealization uh, around the American state. So we'd like to ask our uh, thank our different speakers um, for their contributions to this first debate, talking about the different movements, about Bolivar's movement, the Bolivarian movement on the continent. And they've come together under the framework of a campaign that we've started. And that's this campaign of 
Bolivar versus Monroe. And it's a training seminars that we're doing. And we were looking at it sort of in boxing terms. It's a real struggle. It's a real battle. To thank all of you. Thank you for this process of sharing with all of these organizations throughout the Americas. We'd like to invite you for the upcoming sessions that we're going to have on July 8th, which will be our next session. We're talking about uh, agrarian reform versus la difundio. And then there will be a third. There will be another one on emancipation versus domination. So critical thinking versus colonization thinking. So these will be all of the different topics that we'll be having every single Thursday at this same time. And we hope that you'll be able to share this with all the different organizations that are working in this same direction. Please help us uh, publish these invitations that we're going to be publishing ourselves once a week. And we just really want to thank all of you, all the organizations that are here. Thank you to the uh, People's Assembly. Thank you for the ALBA School. Simon Bolivar, the Simon Bolivar Institute the Tricontinental Institute, and also like to thank the interpreters. Thank you for this arduous task of interpretation to make sure that everyone can understand. And we thank the secretariat that helped to organize it. So thank you all. Thanks so much. And we really are looking forward to 